All right, it's time. Um, hello, welcome uh, to this short paper session about visual ana analytics, decision support, and machine learning. We're going to have th uh, eight amazing works about visual anal analytic tools for model bias, fairness, role based models, consensus ranking, active search, and two dimensionality reduction. Um, without further ado, uh, the first speaker will join us uh, virtually. Uh, David Manachika uh, will talk about uh, Visual Auditor. Um, it's a, a pre recorded video. My name is David Munichika, and I'm an undergraduate student from Georgia Tech. I'm very excited to present Visual Auditor, an interactive visualization tool for detecting and summarizing biases in machine learning models. As I'm sure you all know, machine learning models are everywhere. As consumers, we interact with countless ML models each day as they power everything from the recommendation algorithms of our favorite streaming services to creditworthiness and loan eligibility assessments in banks. With ML models impacting our daily lives, it is essential that these deployed systems exhibit fair treatment across all subgroups of people. Without proper model auditing and validation, we risk encoding prejudicial biases into our models and deploying systems in the real world that can cause serious harm to people. Consider an ML system built to predict recidivism, the tendency of a criminal to reoffend. Even if such a system demonstrated a high overall accuracy, it would be problematic if the system exhibited algorithmic bias and its predictive accuracy varied significantly between different demographic groups, such as sex and race. However, we have seen real-world examples that this bias model has been deployed. Besides recidivism prediction, we have also seen similar examples in credit card scoring, housing advertisements, and mortgage systems. So we've determined we need to audit these models for bias before deploying them. But how do we actually do this? In fact, this problem becomes non-trivial when we consider that bias can be intersectional in nature as well. Looking at combinations of features rather than simply individual features leads to the number of possible ways of slicing any particular data set to grow combinatorially in nature. There is existing research for detecting the most problematic slices or subsets of data but these current algorithms are limited. They're mainly focused on providing textual outputs of the slices and their effect sizes, and fail to offer a visual interface with the capabilities of analyzing problematic slices at a higher level. Other solutions offer better visual interfaces, but require prior knowledge of the particular subgroups of interest. For complex datasets, it becomes infeasible for users to manually consider all potential subgroups of data in order to identify biases. This is why we developed Visual Auditor. Visual Auditor provides a comprehensive visual interface for model bias detection and summarization. It enables ML models to be audited so that underperforming subgroups can not only be surfaced, but also analyzed by human users. We aimed to create a visual overview that effectively summarizes problematic data slices, enables users to hone in on slices of particular interest, Discover similar or overlapping slices and visualizes slice comparisons, and is easily integrated into existing data science workflows. The force layout summarizes the problematic slices in a dataset. Each slice is displayed as a node on a grid and is mapped to an area defined by the intersection of its features. Slices will be spatially located next to other slices defined by similar features. The color of each node maps to its performance compared to the overall model. A darker color indicates worse log loss and more severe underperformance. Similarly, the size of each node represents the sample size of the slice. The force layout is an effective visualization design because it immediately draws attention to the largest and most problematic slices through color and size encodings, while simultaneously conveying information about relationships through clusters of similarly defined slices. The sidebar allows filtering of slices and visualization customization to hone in on slices of interest. Users can change what slice characteristics are defined by color and size, and they can choose the top case slices to show either based on performance or size. 
A minimum slice size can be set to filter out outliers, and the feature checkboxes can be used to look at specific slices containing particularly sensitive features of interest. These various filtering options allow users to quickly identify the most problematic slices within their data and slices that are of particular importance to them. This speeds up the process of identifying the most significant slices hurting model performance and understanding how to mitigate the existing bias. The graph layout is an additional view which shows relationships between slices. The number of overlapping samples between two slices determines the thickness of that particular edge and the strength of the force pulling the nodes together. This results in nodes that share many common data samples being clustered closer together. Lastly, viewing which intersections of features yield the highest accuracies presents users with an additional insight into the performance of their model. To support this analysis, Visual Auditor automatically computes overperforming slices as part of the slice finding algorithm. In any view, users can switch to viewing overperforming slices by toggling on the switch in the sidebar. To increase the accessibility of our tool, users can access Visual Auditor using a web browser or directly within a computational notebook, available on the Python package index. We use a method of converting web-based VA tools to notebook widgets that we call Nova, which will be discussed more during the poster session later on. Computing slices and generating the visual interface can be done in only a few lines of code. To evaluate the effectiveness and usability of Visual Auditor, a user study was conducted with current data scientists and ML practitioners. Overall, study participants found the tool to be easy to understand and enjoyable to use. The domain experts also agreed that Visual Auditor provides new functionality for understanding model bias, auditing models for performance, and finding approaches to mitigate ML bias that did not previously exist. In particular, users found the force layout to be an effective visualization design because it immediately draws attention to the largest and most problematic slices through color and size encodings, while simultaneously conveying information about clusters of similarly defined slices. Participants also found the graph layout insightful by bringing focus to groups of densely connected nodes representing similar slices in order to identify which slices to focus on improving to yield the greatest performance improvement in the overall model. Lastly, all participants appreciated the notebook support and ease of integration into existing workflows. In summary, we developed Visual Auditor, an interactive visualization tool to summarize and detect ML model biases. Visual Auditor offers a comprehensive overview of problematic data slices as well as slice relationships, and it is easily integrated into notebooks and existing data science workflows. Thank you all for listening today. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. So if you have any questions, you can come um, up from. Um, uh, here's a question from Slido. Uh, Daryl asks, if I understand correctly, features along the matrix dimensions are sorted lex lexicographically. Could you make usage of possible feature orderings, for example, by correlation between features or other clusterings? Hi. Um, so yes, this is a very good point that was brought up. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the choice to kind of sort the features like cryptographically um, or alphabetically uh, on those dimensions is basically just to ensure consistency consistency across design, but I understand that if we chose maybe a more um, uh, a sorting method, such as like clustering the, the features based on um, correlation between features or something similar to that, then it might lead to a better separation in terms of the actual clusters of the slices that are output on the graphs and the force layout and the graph layout. Um, so that's a very good point and something that we would definitely consider in our future design of visual auditor. Thank you. Right, especially when you have when your graph have edges, and maybe you can try to reorder it to minimize edge lens, for example. Absolutely, yes, it's yeah. a great point. Cool, thank you. Okay, uh, and next up we have Bang Chun Kuang to talk about RME Explorer. RM Explorer.
Hi. Um, so my talk is about uh, disease risk models. Clinical researchers develop models to predict the risk of diseases using patient data sets. And such risk models provide estimated risk levels of patients for target disease. And before they just deploy and use the models, it is very important to investigate how the models developed when one population performed well for different patient populations. So um, we designed this interactive visualization system called RM Explorer. We had three goals to achieve. Uh, we help users to define their subgroups uh, based on their hypothesis and using patient characteristics. And then they can assess the performances and fairness uh, using different kinds of metrics uh, of the underlying risk models, and then analyze uh, feature importances to uh, the risk scores to understand uh, the about, about the models. So I'm going to walk you through the design of RM Explorer with a case study on atrial fibrillation risk models. So atrial fibrillation, um, AF in short, uh, is a common cardiovascular condition that is one of the leading causes of stroke and heart failure in the elderly population. And so it is very important to predict AF um, early and accurately. In this case study, we selected the following three AF risk models that are well known uh, in the literature to the cardiologists. Namely, we call it EHR, charge and chest models. Those models are linear models, uh, linear additive models. So they produce a risk score, single digit, by computing linear combination of various input um, variables representing pre-existing conditions, medical conditions, and patient characteristics. And then we can convert that score into five-year AF risk rates, and then we use a cutoff value to make predictions for their diagnosis. You can find more details about the models in the appendix of our paper. And then we use this data set, a large-scale observational study uh, in the UK that uh, includes 500K individuals enrolled over 2006 to 2010. And then we selected a subset of them that satisfy the requirements in the table on the right, basically who has some at risk uh, for the AF disease. One question that we followed for the case study is that uh, do those models estimate AF disproportionately with respect to patients' socioeconomic status? So to answer the questions, uh, we defined subgroups using uh, patients' annual income levels and explore how the risk models predict different subgroups indifferently. And in our data set, proportion of individuals by income levels look like this, um, well spread out except for uh, um, the, uh, the, the subgroup number five, uh, who is most wealthy uh, subgroup. So this is how the system looks like. Uh, we launched the system with the rope model and uh, data set. Left side shows the distribution of the characteristic variables. And then we, you can also build subgroups uh, with that. And then top, uh, you show the risk, risk score distributions. And you can also update the threshold to make uh, different model predictions. Um, so we go ahead and launch the system, and we click on one variable to define our subgroups based on, and then uh, click on the summarize subgroups, which will uh, create uh, four more charts. And you can see that there are five uh, color dots, each representing a subgroup. So um, if you hover your mouse, you will also see more details about each subgroup. So top left corner is about the modal performance. So we are using two different modal performance measures. This is a time to event analysis. We're using um, concordance index, which is like an AUCROC score for survival analysis and calibration slope on the x-axis. We also have a, a survival curve that shows the uh, estimated progression rates uh, per each uh, subgroup. And then these two are fairness measures. So those five groups, if they are closer to the 0, 0, which is dotted lines, where the dotted lines cross, this is the, the most optimal fair uh, models, but you can see that they are away from that. Um, and then uh, what you can do uh, is you can also go ahead and switch to different uh, fairness measures. 
Um, we have more than a single measures. We borrow from some uh, literature, including AF360, developed by IBM researchers. And so we can choose um, up to two fairness measures to show up um, and compare the subgroups based on. And also, um, we can expand uh, each subgroup to include uh, two additional models. As I said, there are three um, uh, AF risk estimation models. You can see that vertices of this triangle represents, each, each vertice represents a um, uh, risk model. And so you can see that how models, different models predict differently for different subgroups. And then additionally, what you can do is you can go ahead and click on one of the subgroups to open another view, which um, shows some uh, model importance scores and distribution views. Um, one is the SHAP summary plots, which shows the feature contributions to the model prediction. And then there's parallel trends, which show feature distribution for uh, different subgroups. And one can also uh, adjust the subgroups, uh, risk scores, um, and then see the different uh, fairness measures. Things we learned, um, ARM Explorer, it shows a way to explore performance and fairness of disease risk models. What we found is the subgroups are really keys to examining the risk models. Um, clinical researchers think about how their models react differently to different kinds of patient groups, and they define their patient groups based on age and variety of different pre-existing medical conditions. So keys to uh, define the subgroups. Um, future work ideas, how do we include some automated methods to discover subgroups? And also, if we have many, many subgroups, sometimes mutually ex uh, exclusive, sometimes they're overlapping, how do we visualize them? Another point is about the visual comparison of performance and fairness measures. So people do a lot of comparisons uh, based on different fairness measures and different performance measures. How do we include that in visual analytics pipeline? Also, as you've seen from um, the previous talk and also possibly other talks in the session, uh, I think we, are, we need a lot more work in this domain of uh, bias inspection and fairness exploration. So uh, please check out. So I also presented another work at Eurovis, uh, and I think we need more work in this direction. These are the references, and I thank you so much for your attention. I'll take any questions you have. Thank you for your talk. Uh, Dario asked, sharp values uh, for binary features seems quadrat tightly. Is there a way to improve on that? Um, can you repeat one more time? Sorry. Oh, so the shaft values uh, on the right side of the uh, visualization uh, for binary feature seems quadrat tightly. So there you ask, is there any way to improve on this? Great question. Um, that's also, I think it's a great direction for future work. So feature importance, especially shaft visualization, um, binary features always cluttered, so um, I think, yeah, there's definitely a way to improve it. Great question. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we're going to have Dario and Wheeler talking about visualizing rule-based classifiers for clinical risk uh, prognosis. It's going to be a pre-recorded video. Hello everyone, my name is Dario Antweiler. I am with Fraunhofer IAS Research Institute in St. Augustine, Germany. Together with my colleague Georg Fuchs, I studied visualizing rule-based classifiers for clinical risk prognosis. And today I'm happy to give you a short presentation. We work together with doctors to introduce artificial intelligence systems into hospitals. One challenging task is the early detection of deteriorating conditions in hospital patients. If detected, steps can be taken to prevent conditions like sepsis or acute kidney injury. 
Due to increasing patient numbers and the availability of clinical data, a data-driven decision support system would be highly desirable. We developed the research question whether we can support healthcare professionals with visual analytics tools in developing risk prediction models. In the scenario at hand, we trained multiple rule models to predict deteriorating conditions from medical codes available for a large number of hospital patients. Medical codes describe individual diseases as well as procedures and are integrated into hierarchical structures. Our goal was to develop a visual analytics, analytics system to inspect and enhance those rule-based classifiers by exploiting the hierarchical code structure and facilitate medical background knowledge of users. Previous work can be separated into clinical risk visualization and rule set visualization. Within clinical risk visualization, most approaches focus on individual patient data and their development through time. Rule visualization, on the other hand, often centers around rule metrics like confidence and support. To the best of our knowledge, our approach of a multi-view visual analytics system with both rule-specific and hierarchical visualization is novel. We now present an overview of our approach. The interface consists of multiple interactive and connected views. On the main view on the left, we show rule fingerprints consisting of individual ICD and OPS codes alongside rule metrics and editing handles. On the right, we provide graph-based views to facilitate the inspection of rule hierarchies with respect to the selected rules. Below, the attribute interaction view enables users to inspect groups of medical codes. We introduce rule fingerprints to translate complex code interactions within rules into visual elements for easy inspection and comparison. Individual codes can be added or removed to explore alternative model scenarios. The hierarchical code view lets users explore how selected codes are distributed within the medical coding hierarchy. Each code within the selected rules is highlighted and its occurrence type, positive or negative, is represented by a pie chart glyph. Attribute interactions within rule sets are important for hospital doctors as they can be checked against pre-existing medical knowledge. Some co-occurrences arise through coding guidelines, while others point to disease interactions identified by the rule learning algorithm. We discussed our system with healthcare professionals in multiple structured interviews and received strong positive feedback. Unexpected code combinations are explored more easily and the system is helpful to explore alternative rule sets. We are looking forward to extensions, such as including an editing timeline to showcase the impact of rule changes, an optimization of the visual co-occurrence encoding, as well as the extension to demographic and laboratory records. I would like to thank my collaborator and acknowledge the support of the Fraunhofer Cluster of Excellence. I will now be available for your questions. Any questions from the audience? Daryl, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, cool. Um, I'll start. Um, so, do you have any insights on how to resolve the overplot in a hierarchical code view? Yeah, that is a really difficult problem, and we try to solve it to give users only um, a course guideline on what um, coverage the codes in the hierarchy have. We understood from doctors that they kind of have good background knowledge on the main chapters of the hierarchy. There are about eight main chapters and they do know their way around them quite good, but we could extend it to like a zoom version on the hierarchical view. So that would be an interesting extension. Right, so something like a zooming um, 
uh, fish eye view. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you. So next, uh, thank you uh, for the. Uh, and um, next up, Zijie uh, Wang will talk about uh, timber track. Uh, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jay Wang. I'm very glad to present my work, Timber Track, exploring and curating decision trees with an interactive visualization. It's my screen. Should I unplug and replug it? USB-C. Nice. Thank you so much. All right, hello everyone, and try again. Okay, so here, in recent years, I've seen a booming of machine learning models. However, most machine models are black box models, meaning that we don't really know what's happening inside of those models. However, in high stake domains, people prefer interpretable models. So using those inherently transparent models, people know what's going on after deploying those models, so they can minimize the harm if we deploy those models. And among those transparent models, one well, particular one is called sparse decision tree. Those sparse decision tree have very classical decision tree structure. So here I'm using color to encode the different features, and I'm using plus and minus sign to encode the output of the binary classification. And we call, spar we call a decision tree sparse if it's short, maybe four to six levels. And people like the, the sparse decision tree because they're very accurate. So within some recent technique, people can find out those models can be as accurate as other black box models, and also very easy to understand. And also, sparse decision tree are very simple, so people can even memorize decision rules. However, when we are training decision tree, we find an interesting phenomenon. There are many different trees that have a different structure, that are using different features, but they have very, very similar accuracy. Researchers call them Rashomon effects, so it had to become a more recent, a new field of study. A Rashomon effect is formally defined as a different descriptions of the same incident. So maybe you have heard of a story before. So one man asks three different people to why they wear a blindfold and touch an elephant, and let them guess what object they're touching. And then based on the position they're touching, people have different guesses, like snake, wall, and spare. Those are all incorrect, but they are faithful description based on the information they have. And it's the same in machine learning, right? So we replace elephant as a complex world and use the people wearing blindfold as machine learning models with limited information. So they have different structure, but they have the same accuracy. So that's a rational in fact in machine learning. Research had to find that people call those like a set of machine learning models as a Rushman set. And Rushman set can be large, it's definitely more than three models. And with more recent research, research have found for sparse decision trees can be even huge. You have more than 1,000 trees, have very, very different structure, but they have very similar accuracy. It poses a new practical challenge. So how can we help the practitioner, the data scientists, choose the best tree that fits their needs and goals? So the research problem becomes how do we summarize the huge Rashomon set of sparse decision trees? And we think visualization can help. Okay, let's look at one decision tree. So when people look at decision trees, they want to interpret it. They want to look at different decision rules. So we can trace the tree from the root to the leaf. So we can track four decision rules. And all decision rules capture all the information of decision trees. So we can get rid of the tree. So right now, the problem becomes how do we summarize the decision rules? And we can repeat the same process for all the decision trees we have. So if we have 1,000 decision trees, we probably have five to 6,000 decision rules. And to save some space on the screen, we can use the radial layout to put it in a circle. And here, look at, like, I use a color to encode different features, so I can sort them based on the feature that I'm using. Let's add some abstraction. For example, I can group them, to group the notes together if they're using the same feature. So we have a donut chart for one level. Let's repeat again to a different level, have another donut chart, and again, Eventually, we have a Sunburst chart, which is a very popular visualization technique to visualize hierarchical data. 
Then by leveraging the idea of a sunburst, we designed and developed the first native realization tool to help users to explore and curate decision trees. We call that tool Timber Track. And Timber Track is open source and we have a public demo. So we encourage you to try out the tool by visiting the link on the top right. And right now, we'll give you a short demo of this tool. In the demo, I will use a receive the prediction model. So it's binary classification. We will use some features like age, sex, and prior crime to predict the likelihood of someone would really offend in two years. So when user open the tool, they can see a sunburn chart in the middle. So here again, I use a different color to encode different features, and I use a different brightness of the color to encode different ranges of continuous features. So user can hover over different arc sectors to see the name of the feature and also the value of the feature. User can click one arc vector to zoom in, which allows to show all the decision rules that using that particular feature at a particular level. User can also do more, you can click more to zoom in more. User can hover over the gray sectors to see the decision tree correlated with that decision rules. For example, here, we are looking at the blue to green. So sure enough, the blue to green decision rule is highlighted in the decision tree. Once user find an interesting decision tree, they can click the gray sector to ping that tree. So it opens up a tree window. So in the tree window, we'll show more information about individual decision trees. And the user can also click like top menu to control how many levels you want to see in the sunburst chart. And the user can click the center of the sunburst chart to go to the original layout. Okay, let's find a different tree. Okay, so this tree looks interesting, and we can pin that tree window. And all the tree windows are repositionable, so the user can simply drag and run to have side-by-side -side comparison. And here, user can also toggle the scale by sample size button. So here, we use like the rectangle width to encode the number of free training, free training, data, training data going to that node. So people would prefer more balanced trees in practice, so we prefer the left tree. So we can click the hard button to favorite, to favorite that tree into our bookmark, like to bookmark that tree. We can also add some comment to document why do we like that tree. Another feature of TimberTrack is the search panel. So on the top right, you can see using the slider to drag around to select trees with particular accuracies. Also, you can use the slider, same again, to select trees how balanced they are. You can use a checkbox to select a tree with particular height or using particular features. User can also use the checkbox to select trees using particular features at a particular levels. Okay, let's imagine what did a scientist or practitioner to make a model for different prediction for the judges. We want to make sure our model are fair, right? So we don't want to have some sensitive feature like age and sex. So we can easily do that by, un by uncheck the checkbox by age and sex. And then we want to make a more balanced tree, so we can drag a slider. This tree looks pretty good. So we can see it's very simple, accurate, and also fair. So we can write down our comments and also save that tree. Sure enough, the tree goes to the favorite panel along with the tree we selected earlier. Once after we finish the curation process, we can click the download button to download the JSON file, including all the information about the trees. And the user can load the JSON file in the Python package and deploy the tree. Besides using TimberTrack in browsers, all the practitioner data scientists can use our tool in competition notebooks, ranging from Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, Google Colab, to VS Code notebooks. To do that, we use a technique called Nova, so which is a simple method to convert any web-based VA tools into comp notebook-compatible VA tools. So if you want to learn more, you can go to the poster session later and talk to me. And some limitation about TimberTrack includes number of colors. So here we're using color to encode different features. So if there are too many features, it may run out of colors. Also, timber track is the only support binary classification right now. And for future work, we want to use timber track as a research instrument to see what data scientists or practitioner would use, what kind of tree do they want. And that's all I get all my talk. And again, timber track is open source and public. We encourage you all to try out the tool and feel free to give me any feedback and questions. Thank you so much. Questions from uh, Dario. Color coding could be difficult for a large number of features. How could you redress this? Yes, exactly. That's a very good question. That's also the number one limitation for TimberTrack. 
So right now, we're working with researchers. So we have a different binning strategy to control the number of features we use, or different number of ranges containing the features. But then for future work, we have to think about more, more idea about how do we design or color code different features. Maybe we can think we can have a different model to fewer features. Maybe we can use high dimensional reduction techniques to control the number of features we are using. And actually, there's some research showing that people would prefer a model with fewer, fewer features. If you have too many features, the model is not interpretable. And the reason people like sparse decision trees is because they are interpretable. So we want to make sure there is a balance, the trade off between the number of features, of the complexity of the uh, model, and how interpretable they are. But that's a very good question. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Nat Natalia asks, after transforming tree to rules, the feature ordering is not meaningful anymore. Do you rearrange the features when you aggregate the rules? Yes, that's another good question. Let's see, we can show this tool. So after transforming the decision tree into decision rules, we will order them based on the feature they're using. So if you look at this graph here, for the first level, we'll first do some different order of features. So for example, we we'll order them based on the inner ring by the blue to light blue to orange. And again, among within the dark blue, we sort them again based on the feature they do. So it's a typical the way to draw the Sunburst chart. All right, thank you. Uh, there are more questions, but I'll, I'll leave that to the Discord channel. Right. And Thanks. thank you. Next up, we're going to have Hilson Shresha talking about Fairfield's interactive visual support for fair consensus ranking. Um, hi everyone, I'm Hilton Shresha from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And in this short paper, we present FairFuse, an interactive visual support for generating and um, analyzing fair consensus rankings. So decision making by forming a committee is really common in our society where a group of stakeholders put forward their opinions to form a consensus. And a type of such consensus building involves the use of rankings. Let's take an example of such scenario which involves the use of rankings. Let's say we have a group of students who are qualified to get some form of scholarships. And say we have three teachers teaching math, reading, and writing who rank this group of students based on their performances in their subjects like GPA and other attributes like um, assignment completion or activities in class. And now let's say that you are the decision maker of the committee and you need to build a consensus ranking that best represents all the rankings provided, which is a really complex and time-consuming task. And now to complicate things even further, we have attributes like race, religion, or gender as in this example here, which are also known as sensitive or protected attributes. These attributes um, cannot be discriminated against. And so when we introduce these attributes, we may find that some of these base rankings could be biased in certain ways, favoring one group over the other groups. And such bias is also reflected in the consensus ranking. Here, the woman group is underadvantaged. So now you have a bigger problem of not just ensuring that you get a ranking that best represents all the rankings provided, but also to ensure that it's fair to all the groups in the protected attribute. So, here are some of the tools which can be used to generate consensus ranking or generate and analyze ranking in general. Now we want to extend this consensus generation process to include bias mitigation algorithms and visualization to support fair decision making. In the fairness community, the predominant method to mitigate bias is the notion of group fairness. So group fairness is conceptualized as treating all the groups similarly. And in the example that we showed earlier, the idea is to generate a, a ranking that looks something like this, where the woman group is not under advantage. One of the recent works in this field is the work by my colleague, Koshel et al., which introduced metrics and algorithms to generate fair consensus rankings. And two of the metrics introduced in her work are favored peer representation, or FPR, which is the measure of treatment of each group in a ranking like the advantage of the man group or the woman group. And the next is the attribute rank parity or ARP, which 
um, gives the level of fairness of each ranking considering all the groups in the ranking. So extending on this previous work, in this work, we present visual encodings for group-based fairness metrics, design and development of the Fairfuse tool itself, and case studies to demonstrate how the Fairfuse tool can be used in decision-making. So now let's take a look at the Fairfuse tool itself. Fairfuse is composed of several views. First, we have the ranking exploration view. This view displays all the rankings provided by the stakeholders on the left, and on the right, we have the generated consensus ranking. Each candidate being ranked has a set of attributes and a protected attribute like race. The protected attribute is displayed on the left with a large square and all other um, attributes, non-protected attributes are displayed on the right with uh, smaller shapes. So each candidate appears across all the rankings with lines connecting them. And lines are colored based on the degree of change between the adjacent rankings and the red denotes the decrease in position, and blue denotes the increase in position between the adjacent rankings. So this view essentially helps uh, decision maker find if there is any disagreement uh, between the uh, rankings for any particular candidate. Next, we have group fairness view. Let's say we have a large list of candidates, and we have five race groups, and we want to identify uh, the disadvantaged groups, or say we want to identify whether this given ranking is fair or biased. So it would be really difficult just by looking at this ranking, right? So to help this, we separate out each of these groups into their own column and plot it in the FPR scale from zero to one. So the dots above the 0 0.5 FPR line indicate that the group is overadvantaged, and dots below the 0 0.5 FPR line indicate that the group is underadvantaged. And the difference between the most and the least advantaged group is colored in this gray box. So this gray box gives the ARP score, which is the measure of fairness of this entire ranking. So fairer consensus ranking will have smaller gray box or, and lower ARP score. And we have the heat map, which shows the distribution of the candidates and the group. So essentially, this group fairness view displays fairness at the group level and also at the ranking level. Next, we have the consensus generation process. So we have a button to generate consensus ranking. It generates fairness unaware consensus ranking to start with. And next, the UI is updated with a slider, which can be used to generate fairer consensus ranking. As you, gener as you increase the uh, fairness threshold, you generate fairer consensus ranking, which has lower ARP score, as represented by this thinner gray box. However, as you tend to increase uh, fairness, you tend to lose the representation of the uh, base rankings. So to help this, we have group similarity view. So, sorry, it's rank similarity view. This facilitates the comparison between any two given rankings. So finally, we have compressed view. This view displays a uh, a large number of rankings in a single view at once. So to summarize, um, decision making, uh, fair decision making is really complex and time consuming. And while there are algorithms to generate fair consensus rankings, they have not been operationalized in interactive systems. So Fairfuse combines fairness metrics and algorithms with visualization techniques for ranking and consensus generation. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, anonymous asks, are the fairness metrics only based on equal representation? Can the metrics be custom to fit different groups or dis distributions of data? Uh, could you repeat that? Sure. Are the fairness metrics only based on equal representation? Can the metrics be customized to fit different groups or distributions of data? So for now, we are just considering um, one particular metrics. But as a future work, we are planning to um, implement multiple uh, fairness metrics as well, and also like compare between those metrics. Right. So for now, we are just uh, limited to one particular metric. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so let's thank the speaker again.
Thank you. So next up, we're going to have uh, Shayan Madajemi talking about guided data discovery in interactive visualizations via active search. All right, hopefully it will stay on. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Shayan Monad Jemi, and I am a PhD candidate from Washington University in St. Louis. Today, I will be presenting on our, uh, I will be presenting our work on guiding users during data discovery. All right, so as data, okay, as data sets grow in size and complexity, it becomes increasingly overwhelming for humans to explore individual instances. Let's consider some real world examples. Well, during my internship at NASA, I kept hearing uh, about the large amount of satellite data arriving on Earth, and only a small subset of those data is useful for analysis. Another example, I have been collaborating with the United States intelligence community, and oftentimes in order for them to solve maybe a murder mystery, they have to sift through a ton of information, only a sm small subset of which is relevant. So in these examples, uh, the amount of irrelevant information makes the task overwhelming and time consuming, a concept known as information overload. Uh, yet this process is so common in analytic, in analytic overflows that it, it is its own cycle, and we call it the data, data foraging cycle. Uh, what if our analysts could have a machine teammate who learned from their interactions and guided them in data foraging and discovery? This is precisely the topic of our work. All right, so the goal is to first create that human machine teaming, and then to second, evaluate it empirically through a user study. All right, so we approach this problem from an active machine learning perspective. The fundamental question in active machine learning is, which data point should I label next in order to maximize my objective function? So traditionally, the objective function has been to maximize, to train the best model possible. Uh, we believe this is synonymous to an analyst deciding which document or satellite image to, to investigate in order to solve the task at hand. Here, the objective is to efficiently identify relevant instances and ignore the irrelevant ones. Well, uh, you may ask, what is the state of the art active learning algorithm for this objective? Uh, well, we ran a set of simulations with some baselines and we found out that the answer is active search. I'm not going to go through the details of the simulation. However, the results are in the paper. Um, so now, now that we have the approach, uh, we, decided to consider, uh, we decided to consider a scenario that is very similar to the intelligence analysis one mentioned earlier. So in the fictitious city of Vastopolis, a terrorist attack has spread harmful chemicals in the air and water, initiating an epidemic. Authorities have access to social media posts and their posting locations, so they want to analyze the data to identify impacted in individuals, their symptoms, and maybe how the disease is spreading. This is the vast challenge from 2011, by the way, a scenario that was designed to represent a real-world intelligence analysis task. Uh, in our system, the active search queries that I mentioned earlier would be shown by uh, bright orange recommendations popping on the visualization. And on this visualization, the purple dots are, of course, the uh, microblogs uh, at their locations. And when you hovered them, you could see the content of the microblog. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. All right. 
the user study setup. So in this user study, uh, we drew our attention to that early phase of sense making, namely data foraging. Hence, the task was to ident identify as many illness-related microblogs as possible. Uh, so again, we designed and implemented this web-based tool containing a map visualization of microblogs at their posting locations. Hovering on the dots triggered a tooltip containing the microblog and the option to bookmark a data point. In the back end, we implemented an active search algorithm that learned from user bookmarks and recommended points deemed relevant to the task, shown to the user by the dots on the map. Um, uh, we, of course, had to tweak the active search algorithm a little bit in order to deploy it in this interactive setting. Um, and we put this tool on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. We recruited participants. We randomly assigned them into two groups, the control group, which did not receive any recommendations from an active search algorithm, and the active search group, uh, which did uh, receive the recommendations. And we gave people 10 minutes in order to find as many uh, points as possible. Let's look at some of our findings. Um, so first, we'll look at how the overall throughput over time compares between the two groups. Here on the x-axis, we have the time since the beginning of the session, and on the y-axis, we have the total number of relevant microblogs discovered at that time. As we can see, uh, the active search group outperforms the control group for the duration of, of the session. Um, some form of tab, a little bit of a tabular analysis. Now let's look at some other types of interactions. For example, the hovers, the process of invest, uh, inspecting those points. So again, here we have the control group and the active search group. Uh, when we look at the hovers per minute, we see that the control group was working harder, meaning they were hovering on more points per minute on average, uh, well, significantly. And, and when we look at what, uh, how many of those points were relevant, meaning they were illness-related, we see that the active search group actually uh, inspected more relevant points. So in a sense, the active search group, uh, well, the control group was working harder, but the active search group was being more efficient. And we also looked at the hover purity, which is a metric of the proportion of relevant hovers over total hovers. And again, active search group was significantly, had a significantly higher purity. All right. Uh, lastly, let's look, at, uh, let's look at an observation that actually surprised us. Uh, in this histogram, we look at the proportion of the uh, bookmarks. So we are looking at, did the users use their accommodations or not? So on the x-axis, we have the proportion of the bookmarks from suggestions. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of the users. We, have, we see two peaks here. Uh, about like 20% of the participants did not interact, uh, did not bookmark any of the recommendations at all. Uh, further investigation revealed that this behavior was not due to the quality of the recommendations. Uh, we, however, did observe some suggestive, some suggestive evidence that participants who did not bookmark any recommendations trusted them less than those who interacted with them. This highlights an important avenue for further research, how to promote trust and engagement in human-machine teams. So finally, my takeaways are that Selecting an appropriate active learning algorithm that maps to a given visual analytic task is critical for performance. Second, active search maps to the data foraging cycle of sense making and accelerates the process of discovery. And lastly, factors such as trust and engagement in human machine teams are open for investigation and critical for effective guidance. I would like to thank my supportive advisors and collaborators from whom I have learned, I have learned a lot during this project. Now I would like to answer any questions. All right, thank you for the talk. Um, Anonymous asks, in this system, what makes a good recommendation during sense making? Are you optimizing for similarity or novelty in relation to past book bookmarks? That's a great question, yes. so. We are, in a sense, showing people more of what they have bookmarked before. And this also highlights, is that a good metric or not? Um, in this particular task, uh, it was. However, we can, so one of the beauties of this work is that we can think about what do we care about in an analysis session and build those into our objective function. Of course, that would be a 
longer term trajectory? Thank you for that question. Yes. And uh, Mi Feng asked, uh, how do you define relevance, relevant hover? So if I understood correctly, how do you define relevance for hovers, correct? Yes. OK. So our task that we gave to the mechanical turkers was to identify illness-related uh, documents. So therefore, we marked each bookmark as relevant or irrelevant based on a set of keywords. And we compiled this keyword by going on a CDC website and finding what are the flu symptoms, for example, because the ground truth in the task was that this epidemic is having like flu-like symptoms. So that's, that's how we label them as relevant versus irrelevant. Nice. Uh, I'll leave other questions to the Discord channel. And thank you. Uh, thanks, speaker, again. Thank you. Next up, we're going to have um, Yu Shun Wang and Yun Xuan Lian talking about parametric dimension reduction by preserving local structure. Hi, my name is Yun Xuan Lian from National Yangming Jiao Tong University. And I'll present our work, Parametric Dimension Reduction by Preserving Local Structure. Dimension reduction techniques are widely utilized to facilitate uh, data exploration and visual analysis. The goal is to project data from high dimensional space to low dimensional embedding while either retaining the global or local structures. And one of the famous uh, method is TISNIM. It attempts to maximize the probability that a nearby or distinct data point in a high dimensional space to be nearby or distinct data point in a low, low dimensional space. And here we don't need to look into the math, but just want to give the high level idea of TISNIM. It models the um, similarity of data in the high dimensional space by the joint probability distribution P and employ the heavy tail student T distribution to compute the joint probability distribution Q in a low dimensional space. And then try to minimize the KL divergence between these two joint probability distribution. It is uh, important to know that this kind of method is a non-parametric method. The advantage of a non-parametric method is that it has a high, uh, high flexibility to determine the position in a low, low dimensional space. However, this kind of method can have lack of generalization, which means that once you get the transformation from the given data set, you cannot use this trans uh, transformation to reduce the dimensionality of the new data. Hence, our goal is to extend this need from non-parametric to parametric by training a neural network. Um, that is, um, the input of the network is the high dimensional data, and the output is low dimensional data. And the loss function is KL divergence. So the advantage of this parametric TISNI is that it can reduce the dimensionality of an unseen data, which is beneficial for the streaming data visualization. However, previous method claim that if you train the neural network directly by using the TISNI objective function, then the model will get stuck in a poor local minimum. Hence, in their method, they either require the pre-training uh, network like use the re, uh, restrict Boltzmann machine, or they need the in, intermediate result get from the traditional TISNI when training their neural network. But in our uh, work, we found that actually the reason technique can prevent this kind of training problem, uh, especially the atom optimizer and leaky value function. 
So this figure shows that it, uh, the result get from the different model that use different optimizer and activation function. As you can see that a proper optimizer and activation function are essential for training the neural network to reduce the dimensionality. Specifically, the atom optimizer because it considers the momentum. So uh, if we use only small amount of number of data to update, update the network, and it can prevent a high oscillation. And the ReLU or leaky ReLU activation function because it can prevent a gradient vanish. That is a common problem occur if you use the sigmoid activation function. Besides the generalization, uh, the, com the computation complexity of the TSNI is expensive. This is because whenever the local position in a uh, low dimensional space is updated, then you need to recompute the joint probability distribution again. Hence, if there is n data point in the data set, then the computation complexity is big O n squared. But because of the independent, identically uh, distributed assumption, so the neural network can be trained using a stochastic gradient descent. And then uh, in each iteration, only a small amount of number of data are used to update the network. So if B is the batch size, then the computation complexity is reduced from the big O n squared to big O b squared. Now we are going to look at several uh, evaluation results. And the first one, uh, this one we want to focus on the ability of generalization. So the parameters are trained using the uh, training set and evaluated on the testing set. This embedding are generated by the baselines and our method. And in the embedding, each dot is a sample and each distinct color is a class. So the dots in the same color should gather and dots in a different color should separate. And as can be seen, our method generated good 2D embeddings because of the noticeable boundaries of clusters. And besides the visual comparison, we quantitatively evaluate the dimension reduction results but here need to know that um, dimension reduction is an year post problem. So we need to consider several evaluation metrics jointly. Here we consider three well-known and easily interpretable metrics, they are trustworthiness, continuity, and neighborhood heat. The upper part of this table shows that the result get from the baselines and our method. And each model parameter as was chosen for each data set. However, in order to understand how robust the method is with respect to its parameter, we choose the parameter that were best on all the data set. And the result is shown at the bottom of this table. And as can be seen, our method outperformed baselines in most of the data set. Finally, uh, we compare the computation time of our uh, method and baselines. And our method only slower than a linear model PCA. That's because the uh, network is trained using a uh, stochastic gradient descent. And we refer audience to our paper for details. And thank you for your attention. Our source code is available. Thank you for the talk. Uh, Anonymous asks, did you test your method using other dimensional reduction evaluation methods, like for example, the metrics for the global structure or cluster structure, such as uh, silhouette coefficient? Um, no, because we, um, we mainly focus on compare to the method. Yeah, talk to the, to the mic. <laughs> we mainly focus on uh, to compare with that uh, those model are new using neural network to train with the objective function using a Disney objective function. 
so where they can focus on that part. But that's an interesting question. Right. And uh, I'm also wondering, how do you compare your work to parametric UMAP? Like, given the similarity to matrix is dense for Tizani, uh, how many iterations do you have to train to convergence relative, for example, the data set size? Oh, mm. yeah. Um, for the uh, for the training iteration, I think it depends on the data set. Right. So, so it. It doesn't have a specific number, but uh, it is important to know because this needs a non-parametric method. So uh, once we use the parametric method, it's hard to uh, perform as best as the Disney. So that's one of the shortage. Maybe we can try to improve in the uh, future. However, um, because we can reduce the computation complexity, so the time is much faster. Thank you so much. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. And the last speaker, Hyung Jong, is going to talk about uniform manifold approximation with two phase optimization. So again, the work about dimensional reduction. So maybe this will be the last presentation for today. So please focus me. So hello, my name is Hyun Jun, a first year PhD student from Seoul National University. <clears throat> Here, I'm presenting the paper about improving a famous dimensionality reduction algorithm, which is called UMAP. So our technique is called uniform manifold approximation with two-phase optimization, in short, UMATO. So <laughs> As you see in the previous presentation, dimensional reduction is one of the most useful tools for exploring high-dimensional data in visual analytics. So it gives an abstract 2D summary of high-dimensional space so that we can visually explore and analyze the data. Uh, recently, nonlinear dimensional reduction techniques such as TISNI and UMAP have shown great performance in capturing complex local manifolds. Now, our question is, how about the global structure? Nonlinear DR techniques are certainly good at preserving local structures. Yes, that's right. However, their ability to capture the global structure of high dimensional data is questionable. So here you can see the three regions or clusters enclosed by red, blue, and green contours. In the projection, the blue region is in between the red and green regions. Here, my question is, can it be said that the blue region is between other two regions, even in the high dimensional space? The answer is, obviously, no. You may ask the reason why. To answer this, let's look at how TISNI and UMAP works. For TISNI, the problem is its loss function. TISNI uses kullback leibler divergence, which is usually called as KL divergence, and it naturally gives less penalty to the points that are distant in the high dimensional space, but close in the low dimensional projections. So on the other hand, Yuma escapes from this issue by using the cross entropy loss function rather than KL divergence. However, Yuma still hardly captures the global structure as it optimizes the layout based on the K nearest neighbor graph. There are also other reasons, but I'll just skip it. Please check my paper for the details. So to resolve such problems, we present a UMATO, a new dimensionality reduction technique that improves UMAP for better preservation of the global structure. So UMATO is equipped with two key concepts. So the first one is that UMATO picks the representative points called hubs and uses them to construct a skeletal layout preserving the global structure. So you can think that they are like the main actors of the high dimensional data. So it also separates the optimization of the hub points and non-hub points so that the global and the local structures can be both well preserved. OK, now let's see the pipeline. So overview is quite simple. You must start with classifying the points into three groups. So I'll explain about this slightly later. Then in the layout optimization phase, three groups are optimized separately. So that was the overview. Let's go for the detail. So 
we first search for the hub points. So again, you can just understand that hub points are the main actors or main characters of high dimensional data. So the procedure is quite simple. We construct the K nearest neighbor graph, count the frequency of each point in K nearest neighbor graph, which means that we search for some kind of highly connected points in the nearest neighbor graph and select them as hub points. Uh, then we search for the friends of the hub points, which we call as extended nearest neighbor, in short, ENN. So ENNs are found by recursively seeking out hub points nearest neighbors. So nearest neighbors of hub points and their nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor again, like that. So it is similar to the connected components. So you can just understand it like that. And finally, the remaining points, the points without friend, pole, are set as outliers. So now we have three groups, hubs, ENNs, and outliers. We optimize them separately to preserve both global and local structure. So optimizing hub points is for maintaining the global structure, and optimizing ENN is for maintaining local structure. Let's see how they are optimized. At first, we optimize the layout of hub points. This step is performed without approximation, which is common in dimensional reduction. Uh, so this enables the algorithm to be more robust and less biased in capturing the global structure. Then we optimize the layout of both hubs and ENN simultaneously. So this tab is quite similar to the one of UMAP or some kind of typical dimensional reduction technique like Disney. So you can just understand it like that. So, but the difference is that we limited the movement of hub points so that the optimization will not be able to destroy the well-constructed global structure which was constructed in the previous phase. And last, outliers are embedded. So it is quite easy. So prevent, to prevent the outliers to sabotage the overall structure, we simply embedded each outlier near its nearest neighbors. So that's all. So I think the algorithm is quite simple. And you might um, wonder how it works. So inevitably, we compared UMATO against six baseline dimensional reduction techniques, of course, including UMAP. So we use both global metrics and local metrics to evaluate the techniques capability in preserving both the global and local structures of high dimensional data. So the detailed research is in the paper. Anyway, in summary, the research is like this. So for the global metrics, UMATO was the winner. So that's really good. However, for the local metrics, TSNI and UMAP was a common winner. Still, UMATO showed competitive performance. So in summary, we can conclude that UMATO achieved high performance in capturing global structure with a slight loss of local structure preservation. That's good. Again, check the detailed results in the paper. So any, anyway, I think the qualitative results will be more interesting. So we will now project the data set consisting of 10 small inner hyperspheres enclosed by a single outer hyperspheres using the techniques we compared. I did not provide the illustration, so please imagine the structure. Just imagine it. So these are the results. So which one best matches with your imaginations? So I think the UMATO is the best. <laughs> so I think here you can see that the relationship between the inner and outer spheres are all distorted in all the projections except UMATO. So that's what all we did. For more details, please come and talk with me or just read my paper. The great news is that you can just download and use UMATO. It's available via PIP. You can just download it, yeah. And also one more thing. So I'm also seeking for the internship position next summer. So please contact me if you guys are searching for a passionate student to work with or knows who does. I have several works in visualization and machine learning and they can be checked in my website please visit hyunjun.com. So thank you for the listening and enjoy the banquet. Thank you for the talk. Um, Song Hyun Lee asked, can you explain the running time of the algorithm compared to UMAP, how fast or how slow the UMATO is? Uh, I think that's a really a great question. So actually, our algorithm improves UMAP and adds some kind of additional pipelines to UMAP. So it is slightly slower than the UMAP. So our future work is to implement UMATO into some kind of heterogeneous system, you know, such as GPU or those kind of things. So that will improve this algorithm, I think. All right, sounds great. Um, another one. High number of neighbors parameter in UMAP ensures a better global structure capture. Did you, cap did you compare your method to different values of this parameter? If so, 
were the result equivalent between UMATO and UMAP with, high, with a high neighbors at some point. So it's asking about number of neighbors as a parameter. Yes, I think that's also a great question. So in our evaluation, which you can check in our paper, so we optimize, we use the Bayesian optimization so that the UMAP can, UMAP can get the best performance as they can. So we chose the best hyperparameter that can UMAP can achieve and then compare it to UMATO. So I think it's quite fair evaluation and also consider those kind of aspects in different hyperparameters. Great, thank you. So that's it for this uh, short paper session. Please join me to thank all the speakers and give special thanks to the technical support, student volunteers, and modulators. Hope you all have a great evening, and I guess we will see each other in a banquet. Thanks. <laughs>